Hello, everyone. I am Chris Hyam, CEO of Indeed. At Indeed, our mission is to help people get jobs. And this is what gets us out of bed in the morning and what keeps us going all day. And what powers that mission is our people. And here to help is a look at how experience, strength, and hope inspires people to want to help others. I am incredibly excited today to introduce our very special guest. Emily Chang is an award-winning journalist and author. She is executive producer at Bloomberg TV and host of Bloomberg Technology and Studio 1.0, reporting on global technology and media companies, startups, and the future of business. Business Insider has called Emily the star of Bloomberg anchor that everyone in tech needs to know. And she ranks among the top journalists, followed by major CEOs on Twitter. And with all of these amazing accomplishments, today we're going to spend most of our time talking about Emily's first book, which was published in 2018, titled Brotopia, Breaking Up the Boys Club of Silicon Valley. Brotopia was an instant national bestseller and had a profound, profound impact on me personally, which we'll be getting into in a little bit. Uh, but Emily, thank you so much for joining me today. Chris, thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here and speaking with all of you. Let's start where we always start these conversations um, with a, a quick check-in. How are you doing today? I'm good. I am back in the office. I do a daily show every day. So I um, have been here five days a week since May and it's, you know, got its ups and downs. Like I'm sure everyone has been going through um, with the pandemic. I'm, I'm sure some folks are considering whether to go back to the office now or not. Um, so, um, you know, I am making it work. I've got four kids at home, um, as you know, and so I'm juggling just like everyone else. Well, um, let's dive straight into Brotopia, and um, we're going to talk about various aspects of it. But if you can start by just explaining really um, at a high level what the what the book is about and what inspired you to want to write this book. Um, well, so I've been covering the tech industry now for almost 12 years. And before I got to Silicon Valley, I was working for CNN in London and China. And, you know, I was I covered the Beijing Olympics. I was on the front lines of this massive transformation happening on the other side of the world. And so I thought I was doing something pretty important. Um, and when I got the opportunity to come to Silicon Valley and cover technology, I didn't quite know what to make of it. You know, I knew it would be a learning curve and that it would be exciting and something different, but I wasn't sure that I'd be so excited about covering business every day uh, for many, many years to come. And what I realized is I was really on the front lines of maybe the most massive transformation in history, the technological revolution. And I had a front row seat to all of these amazing people and companies and quote unquote visionaries who are changing the world or at least trying to. Um, but there was this question gnawing at me, which was, where are all the women? I mean, look at all of these, you know, supposedly amazing men who's, who we call by their first names and um, there are no women and no one's really talking about this. And women are underrepresented, you know, among CEOs and entrepreneurs and investors, but also in the rank and file. And how can that be possible in an industry that's so important and, and changing so many of our lives in so many ways every single day? And I started to get more sort of intentional about, about asking the guests on my daily show, um, what are you doing about this? What are you doing to hire and promote and fund more women? And, you know, normally I got some pretty politically correct answers, um, but some of the answers were also quite shocking and unacceptable. And that's what really sort of lit the spark that um, lit the fire that got me to write the book. There's a, a number of um, sort of deep issues that you dive into, but I think at a high level, what I took away from it, there's a few key theses that I think are important to, to understand for everyone. So the, the first one is that um, sexism and gender inequality exist everywhere, but there is a unique flavor to that problem in, in the tech industry. Uh, number two, that uh, tech is uniquely important because of its ubiquity and the impact on all of our lives. Um, and then number three, that this problem exists really at, at, at every level in technology from the people on the front line who are writing the code to founders and VCs. So um, can I ask you just to talk a little bit about how sexism and gender inequality in tech fits into this larger societal challenge and what's different about tech here? Now, one of the most 
sort of shocking interviews I did very early in this process was an interview with Michael Moritz, who is a very prominent venture capitalist in Silicon Valley. He works at Sequoia. He, you know, funded, you know, Google and Yahoo and some of the companies that have become the most prominent and biggest and influential in the world. And this was in 2015 and they had no women in their um, US venture partnership at the time. And yet it was considered perhaps, you know, the most legendary, if you got a check from a venture capitalist, you wanted Sequoia. Um, and I said to him, quite frankly, you have no women in your firm. What are you doing about that? Um, and he said, well, we're looking very hard, but we're not prepared to lower our standards. And that comment just hit me like a ton of bricks. Like here is, you know, this, this, this investor seems to think that talented young women just don't exist. Um, how is it possible that in 44 years, you couldn't find a single woman to meet your very high standards? That is unacceptable. Um, and venture capitalists are just one piece of the puzzle, but they are the ones writing the checks with an incredible amount of power over who gets a chance to be the next Mark Zuckerberg or Steve Jobs or Elon Musk. Um, and it was just, you know, a very um, sharp pointed example of how this plays out here every day, multiple times a day. You know, women uh, represent now like 12 to 15% of check writers. So people in Mike Moritz's position, um, women-led companies get just 2% of venture capital funding. How is that possible? 2%, 2%. Um, and then in the rank and file, as you discussed, women hold 20 to 25% of, of the top technical roles, the, the people who are actually writing the code. So they're underrepresented at every stage of the game. And you know these are companies that are making decisions about how we communicate and how we interact with each other and changing our lives and our children's lives dramatically. Um, and women are just grossly underrepresented and the consequences are enormous. So one of the things that's most powerful about the book is you explain in great detail the problem is that as it exists today, but you go back and roll back the clock and, and sort of unroll this amazing history of misogyny in tech, which really goes back to, to sort of the earliest days. And I think most people probably at, at this point, um, in, in some part, maybe thanks to hidden figures, um, many people know that the first programmers were largely women, but somewhere along the way, the industry was completely taken over by men. And um, one of the stories that really, really gripped me, and I'm just going to ask you to retell uh, a little bit for folks that might not be aware of it, is the story of uh, System Development Corporation and this now infamous Cannon Perry test. So that to me was kind of like the smoking gun. You are absolutely right that in the early days, um, men were predominantly the makers of the hardware, the systems and, and the computers and the mainframes that were making the tech industry tick. But you know, in the 40s and 50s, women actually played prominent roles in building the software of the computing industry. The women, for example, that programmed the you know track of, of, of the Apollo to the moon. Um, women were very well represented among um, those groups of people. There was even this amazing article in Cosmopolitan magazine that I found that um, heralded computer programming as this amazing new occupation for women where you could make money and it was kind of like planning a dinner party. You just tell the machines what to do and how to do it. And women are pretty good at that. Um, and there were people like Grace Hopper. She was actually interviewed in, in that article. Um, but what happened in the 60s and 70s is that the tech industry was just exploding and they were so desperate for new talent that they started doing these personality tests and aptitude tests to identify good programmers. And these two psychologists, Cannon and Perry, um, came up with an index of a handful of different qualities that they believed made, made for a good programmer. One of them was a good programmer likes solving puzzles and doing math. Well, that made sense. Um, another was that good programmers, quote, don't like people. Hmm. Well, <laughs> um, if you look for people who don't like people, the research tells us you'll hire more men. 
than women. Um, and there is no research to support the idea that people who don't like people are better at this job than people who do like people. Um, there's also no research across thousands of studies that shows any difference between boys and girls and men and women in math and solving puzzles and that kind of thing. Um, however, this test, which was widely used for many, many years to identify and filter for good programmers with companies as big as IBM, started in the 60s and 70s to filter out women, essentially, um, because they didn't meet these qualifications. And by the way, there's a great argument to be made that we need people who like people developing the products and services that are going to be serving the people of the world, but that's um, another issue entirely. In 1984, women were earning 37% of computer science degrees, but after 1984, that number plummeted to about 18, 20% where it's been flat for the last decade. So my argument is it's not movies or television that created the stereotype of these sort of antisocial, mostly white male nerd. It's actually the tech industry itself that created this stereotype and then perpetuated it for decades. And we came to believe that that's what a talented computer scientist looks like. This guy sort of coding in his hoodie alone in a basement, um, which is absolutely not true. But it pushed and profiled women out of an industry that they were surviving and thriving in. Um, and unfortunately, that's the stereotype and the myth that persists today. Yeah, and that um, that test that they developed um, was was based on on actual research and interviews that they did, which seem actually in retrospect almost to have been designed to to at least give the wrong answer because and I can't remember the exact numbers, but there were something like eleven hundred people that they interviewed, and only one hundred and seventy of them were right. women. When the vast majority of the people who were actually doing the job at the time were women, the vast majority of the people they interviewed were men. Um, so not surprisingly, <laughs> their results favored men. And very unfortunately, that test became sort of the litmus test for who makes a good programmer, but it was wrong. It was wrong. So so this story, you describe it as a as, as a smoking gun. This um, the entire book was was revelatory. But for me, that was the thing that just completely stopped me in, in my tracks. And um, at, I have to at this point get a little personal in terms of how the the book impacted me and and maybe get a little uh, confessional. But if you'll indulge me for a minute, and I know we had a chance to talk about this a little bit, but just to share with everyone else. Um, so I've been working in computing for uh, next year will be thirty years, um, and I have read a lot about the history of computing. I feel like uh, I thought I knew what was going on. I had never heard of this story before. And, and as you said, I mean, it was it was like the Matrix to me. It was like suddenly seeing the code for the first time and understanding. It was just like everything made sense. And so after reading your book, I went and and I told you the story, but I, I looked at my bedside table at the stack of books that um, I had to read, and they were all books by men. Um, and so I decided literally after finishing your book, in, in May of 2018 that I was just going to read women authors for the rest of the summer. Uh, partway through that, I ended up picking up um, Americana by Chimamanda, uh, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, a Nigerian author, and then realized I was also only reading um, white uh, authors. And, and so um, I ended up spending a year uh, only reading women authors. And for the past four years, I've read primarily black, but essentially only um, authors from marginalized communities. And um, and it's completely transformed my view of the world, really, because, you know, I think that what we believe is is dictated in large part by who tells the stories that we listen to. And, uh, you know, I mentioned to you before I went to an elite prep school uh, for middle school and high school. And in six years, um, looking back on it, we read a single book written by uh, a woman author it was Pride and Prejudice. We did not read a single book written by an author of color. And uh, so, so your book had a deeply profound impact on me and um, in and, and sort of trying to turn this into a question, um, <laughs> I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the importance of uh, the voices that we listen to in storytelling and how they shape how we see the world. Well, first of all, Chris, I love that you shared that story because I think making real change starts with intention and we have to be intentional about 
doing this work and understanding other voices, other people in the room, different perspectives, where people are coming from. And it also takes agency, right? I think for so long, people in the tech industry have said, I didn't create this problem, or this isn't my problem, or it was always this way. Well, in fact, it is your problem, and it wasn't always this way. And taking that narrative back and taking control of that, I think, is the first step toward actually making real change. We need leaders, especially at the top of these organizations, to understand the problem and want to make a difference. And I have been so impressed and humbled by, you know, people like you who are like, look, what can I do? How can, how can I change? Um, you know, I want to learn, I want to learn. And, and so much of this is about just sort of educating yourself and just understanding what the starting point is. Um, you know, look, I, I think, we're surrounded by people like Elon Musk and, and Mark Zuckerberg who are building self-driving cars and rockets to Mars and connecting the world. And yet they say, but, you know, you know, when it comes to women, oh, that's just too hard a problem. That's too hard a problem for us to solve. And if we can solve these other problems, we can certainly hire more women and pay them fairly and fund their ideas. Um, but we need buy-in from the leaders of these organizations. Um, but I, I also think that even though that is, is very important, you know, everyone at every level of an organization now has more agency and power than they did before. You know, your voices are being listened to. Your voices, you know, companies need to know they need to listen and, 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 and to hear you. Um, and so I think part of it is, is using that voice and even on your individual teams, making sure that you're making these choices, making inclusive choices when you're thinking about hiring and promotion and, and doling out opportunities or even just the way you run a meeting, right? And solicit feedback and ideas. So that's something that all of us can do, not just the CEO. Yeah, and I think, you know, that, that trope of the, I didn't create this problem, um, in uh, in her book, Cast, Isabel Wilker Wilkerson opens the book with this really great analogy, which is, you know, imagine that you own uh, an old apartment building and you might not have built it, you might not be responsible for it, but if it's yours, if it has crumbling infrastructure, if the pipes are bad, if the ceiling's gonna fall in, it's your building, you better you better fix it. You're responsible for, for what happens from here on out. Um, so, uh, part two of the confessional. So the, the 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 book hit me hard because of of the this story and seeing it the way that I hadn't thought of before. The, the the second part is that one of the things that you do is you uh, the sort of key narrative of the evolution of programmers from antisocial nerd where they started out um, to what you describe as these risk taking bros, and you identify as patient zero essentially in this shift uh, a small not very well known, but influential um, tech software company in Austin, Texas in the 90s called Trilogy. Um, I worked at Trilogy for uh, nine years. It was my first job out of grad school. I stayed there for nine years. Um, what you describe going on at Trilogy, you absolutely nailed. Um, and it was really uh, disturbing for me and a lot of people to sort of look back through a, a 20, you know, almost 2020s lens at what was going on back then. Um, can you talk, first of all, I, how you landed on, on Trilogy, because not many people know the story, and then how you see that fitting into this larger narrative of the shift from the antisocial nerd to what we see now today in Silicon Valley? So one of my sources who also worked at Trilogy said, oh, the bro thing started way earlier than people think. You really got to look at this company called Trilogy. I mean, I think, you know, today we sort of think about, you know, Travis Kalanick at Uber, um, um, kind of personifying this idea of, you know, bro uh, you know, tech visionary, you know, started in late, to, you know, 2009, 2010, um, when really looking at Trilogy is, is a fascinating example that this really goes back to the late 80s and early 90s. I would take it back even a few more years um, to 1984, which is you know when the Mac really came on the consumer scene in a huge way. And Steve Jobs presented this sort of vision of a different kind of tech founder. It was Jobs plus Steve Wozniak, who was kind of the nerdy part of the equation. And um, Jobs, who had this 
this bravado, this level of risk taking and, and sort of um, willingness to take an, an insatiable amount of risk that investors and the public really sort of latched onto. And they kind of um, together were, were, were kind of the best of both worlds, you know, not just the nerdy, more antisocial um, know how, but, you know, this, you know, big, you know, visionary um, attitude, you know, where, where and, and, and level of kind of uber confidence by which you kind of thought that they could do anything. Um, but they didn't, they, it wasn't necessarily a sure thing. Um, and, and, and the job sort of Wozniak team became, became the ideal recipe, right? Can you find someone who's, who's kind of nerdy, but also uber confident and can talk a big game and then try to make it happen? Um, and Joe Lamont, the founder of Trilogy, was almost exactly that, right? He, he married kind of the best of both worlds. And when you go back to, and honestly, Chris, I would love to turn the tables on you for a second, because when you go back to the early days of Trilogy, I mean, the things that happened were just jaw dropping. I mean, he, his sort of philosophy was to hire, quote unquote, only the best OTB. We, we, we only hire super smart kids with no experience right out of college. They don't know how to do anything yet, but they can talk their way out of a paper bag. And that's what we need. Um, and so and, and, and recruiting relied on finding these very attractive young women to go out and find young engineers who would lap it up. And even in that choice, the assumption is that the engineers you're going to find are men who would be attractive to these young, attractive recruiter women. Um, I mean, parties, strippers, credit cards, giveaways of laptops and cars. I believe he gave a car away once as <laughs> a, a, a two cars. Um, and I mean, it was just toxic really. And it, it seems to be to me an, an, an entry point of the, the sort of toxicity and bravado and growiness that really carried on through much of the dot-com boom and bust and then survived, um, into more recent years. So I, I don't know, does that resonate, Chris, with your experience? Yeah, it did. Uh, this is the danger of interviewing journalists, by the way. Um, but, <laughs> Sorry, uh, you're interviewing an interviewer. <laughs> yeah. um, no, 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 look, the, the, the it, it, reading it um, actually physically shook me um, and not because um, I wasn't aware of that stuff because I had sort of pushed it back into the past and, you know, some degree, so I, I was insulated I knew everything that was going on. I was personally insulated because when I joined, you know, as you pointed out, the, the company was all 21 and 22 year olds. I was 30. I was married. I had two kids. I actually lived in in Berkeley and telecommuted to Austin for my first few years. I don't drink. I don't gamble. So um, so I was outside of the, the sort of inner circle, but I knew all the stuff was going on. And, um, you know, it's ultimately... Uh, why I left to start my own company, but I stayed for a long time. I was there for nine years, so um, so I've really had to to sit with that and uh, and to come to terms um, since since reading your book with why it was that I I stayed for so long. And I've spent a lot of time. Uh, the book sparked a lot of conversation among Trilogy alumni. We have a very active alumni group. There was a lot of discussion about, it, and a lot of us got together and spent a lot of time uh, talking about it. And it was um, I, I have to say that uh, I, I, I want to thank you actually for bringing that back up because I think it doesn't, just like all of these other things, understanding history and how we got here is actually incredibly, it's, it's, it's impossible to fix the present um, without understanding the, the past. And I think, I think there were a lot of us for whom this is just what the world looked like. And again, it was my first job. I stayed there for a long time. But um, I think also, you know, from a personal perspective, and, and, and then I'm going to go back to asking you questions, but I'll, I'll just share this. Um, I found myself in a position where I, I think I felt responsible for um, protecting people. And I, you know, I ended up, I started out as an engineer, I ended up as the VP of engineering, and I stayed for a lot longer than I might have because I felt like um, I was sort of a layer of insulation to, to kind of help create a, a different environment for the people who I ran the engineering team who reported to me um, and ultimately saw 
at, at some point that there was nothing that I could do, um, and then and then moved on. But I think it, um, I, I think it would be really interesting for other people because Trilogy was uh, was certainly unique, but but not the only company like it to to really pause and, and look back and and ask some of these questions. And so it has yeah. been um, a real catalyst for reflection. So thank you for that. Um, by the way, you were competing with Microsoft and IBM for talent. And so when Google was coming on the scene and I understand that, you know, uh, this is how a lot of companies operated when it came to yeah, and it, people. It, but a Trilogy, I will say, I mean, we, we as a as a group have talked a lot about, I mean, Trilogy brought a bunch of really brilliant people together, had some really interesting ideas, but the thing that we were truly most world-class at in terms of results was recruiting. That was mm -hmm. the thing that we did, I think, better than anyone else. And it was really interesting to see um, just how how bald-faced and transparent <laughs> all of that really was uh, at the time. And, and um, by the way, can we point out that, you know, you'd hired all of these amazing people, but the product itself, not, it didn't survive, right? Like, I know that it, it, it still kind of ex exists, but I guess it kind of goes to show that that kind of a culture isn't necessarily a recipe for success, even if you have literally the smartest people um, or some of the smartest people, because we know that women weren't as well represented among that group of people um, building the product. Um, you need to have a diverse, a diverse group of voices in the room building the yeah, product. I mean, I, you want to change uh, the world. Well, and so I guess one thing that I'll say is that, um, so first of all, I did learn a lot there and I worked with mm -hmm. a, a lot of brilliant people, but from a cultural perspective, um, one of the biggest impacts that Trilogy had is that almost to a last person, all the people that that I'm close with who were there, who spent th this formative time there, went on to other companies with a very clear point of view about the culture that they wanted to create. Mm -hmm. And so some sometimes um, a negative pattern can still be informative. Mm -hmm. And that um, the number of, of companies that were founded by or basically every tech company right now has as many senior people that came from trilogy and we all had this sort of collective experience that drove us to want to do things differently so i actually i like to think that some good has come from that um but maybe for for unintended reasons um but so getting back to the book one of the things that's that we definitely saw uh, in this in this sort of hiring frenzy that that trilogy was going through um is you talk about this this uh, myth of meritocracy, that um, you know one of the people you talk about a lot is is Peter Thiel in in the PayPal, but it's it's clearly something that is pervasive. Um, can you talk about this this concept of this myth of meritocracy? Right. Um, well, Peter Thiel and Max Levchin, the co-founders of PayPal, in those early days of the company said, look, we're a meritocracy. We only hire the smartest people who can do the job. But when you look at the people they hired, it was really most of their white male friends from Stanford, many of whom wrote for um, the Stanford Re Review, a conservative slash libertarian student newspaper. Um, Peter Thiel, even to this day, doesn't seem to be particularly troubled by that. But Max Levchin, who I, you know, I still interview often on my show, has looked at that and said, we were totally wrong. I lifted the engineering um, team from my university um, computer class, brought them over to PayPal and thought that would be a good thing because we all use the same coding languages and we knew each other and we could move faster. When in fact, ultimately it, it meant they wouldn't be able to hire anyone else because um, you know, no women would wanna join a team where there were no women. And I actually talked to one of the earliest women that they hired who just, she's like, it didn't work out because I was surrounded by all of these men. Um, and the idea of meritocracy is so fascinating um, because uh, if you, if you actually believe in a meritocracy, if you believe that the company that you're operating in, the environment that you're operating in is meritocratic, um, you start to believe that everyone's in their right place, that success looks a certain way, when in fact you are, um, you know, blind to the discrimination and systemic factors that are working against the people who are not in the, the position of success. So believing that you are operating in a meritocracy 
you can actually be more anti-meritocratic because you're not actually looking really hard at yourself um, and, you know, seeing what it really takes to succeed and, and what happens and what are the reasons for, for, for not succeeding, for example. Um, so I believe that actually, you know, saying we're a meritocracy is, is you know, means you are in fact going to be more biased, more anti-meritocratic and a true meritocracy is just impossible to achieve because the escalator of life is moving faster for some people than it is for others. That's just the way it is. We have to see through that. Um, we have to um, implement hiring processes and review systems um, and, you know, progression and promotion systems that take all of this into account and give ourselves a structured set of tools by which to make these hiring and promotion and progression decisions if we want to try to be as fair as possible. So I want to uh, come back to something that I, I mentioned at the top, um, that, that gender inequality exists in, in every industry, but um, in, in technologies, there's this unique power and responsibility. Um, uh, you quote Sheryl Sandberg um, early on as saying, when you write a line of code, you can affect a lot of people. Um, and you give some examples right at the start of the book about Siri and Apple Watch and things like that. Can you, can you talk about the impact of underrepresentation in our lives through the creation of technology? So I'll give you an example that I think we can all relate to. Ev Williams, the co-founder of Twitter, told me that he thinks if they had more women on their early Twitter team, that online harassment and trolling wouldn't be such a problem. Hmm. He said, when we conceived Twitter, we were just thinking about all the wonderful and amazing things that you could do with it. And, you know, also, yeah, you could use it to share what you had for breakfast. Um, we weren't thinking about how you could use the technology as a tool to harass people or troll people because he said, most of the people in the room who were conceiving this product were white men, people who weren't used to being marginalized or harassed or discriminated against. I thought that was pretty powerful. Like imagine if the internet was a friendlier place. Imagine if Twitter, what could, could you know, was a, was a healthier place, uh, was a tool that couldn't be weaponized as easily as it can be today if they had built they there could have been very simple changes in the in the, the very early days of the product where for example you couldn't necessarily just reply automatically to someone uh, you know all of this would have to be debated um but just having someone in the room to say hey i actually think this might women women might not like this or might be you know this product could be used to, to victimize someone else um maybe it would have wouldn't have been such a free for all. Uh, great counterexample. Um, one of my favorite uh, local Austin companies, Bumble, uh, Whitney Wolf heard, um, they started out as a, a dating app that was women centric. And very early on, one of the things that they saw um, was that uh, basically freedom from trolls was going to be an important part of that. Um, and when they saw a lot of vitriol and hate start to to sprout up on uh, on the app, the first thing they did was really from the ground up architect an experience um, that would create a safer and and more peaceful kind of place. So, uh, you know, the plural of of um, anecdote is not data, but um, but that's a to me a really powerful counterexample of what happens when you start with a different thesis. Yep, absolutely. And I think Whitney Wolford and Bumble are an amazing example of also when you start with a female uh, founding team and leadership team, it's easier to hire more diverse candidates and hire more women. And you see that represented in Bumble's executive team and across the company. Um, and certainly it's been a really successful company. Having women at top didn't hold them back from, from doing that, has it? <laughs> well, so you... Um... In the book, obviously, it's it's a, a whole lot of uh, detailing of a bunch of really significant problems. But you also um, do talk to some uh, significant women leaders in, in tech, Marissa Mayer um, at the time, who uh, and and you talk a little bit about some of the challenges she faced in Sheryl Sandberg. You also meet with and talk with women engineers and young girls who are studying coding. Um, what in in all of the the. Uh, sort of darkness here, what are some of the bright spots that you see in the industry? Well, I 
What was so amazing about talking to these women and especially the, the young women engineers and the kind of rank and file is that they love their jobs. They love the opportunity that they have to change the world. Um, but many of them are just kind of exhausted and frustrated with this, like, like sort of having to prove themselves over and over again. I mean, I think they would find that no matter how many names they stacked on their resume, there was, there was often this expectation that you're not good enough to be here. Um, prove it to me. Um, and that's kind of a, a tough hill to climb. Um, however, you know, we are making progress, but slowly. Um, I just today interviewed the chief human resources officer at Twitter, and they, now that they've gone fully hybrid, which I know is a little more extreme than, than some companies, they say it's enabled them to hire more diverse candidates. Um, so just in the last couple of years, the representation of women has gone from 42 to 45%, black employees, seven to 9%, Latina employees, four to, to six or 7%. I believe so you you see it reflected in the numbers now of course they have to focus on making sure they can build a, a strong culture in a, in a more distributed way that doesn't further marginalize some of these people because let's say women are more likely to take a remote role uh, but that means they might be less visible to others in the company how do you make sure that you're not actually discriminating against the folks who are choosing to work in a hybrid environment these are very complicated questions um, that all of these companies are going to have to grapple with but i do see hybrid work as a real opportunity um, the other thing i i I, I, I'm so excited because I got a new example today of a company that's really making change and it's working. Um, they've really doubled down on pay transparency and making sure that um, it's very clear across the workforce what the ranges are and how you can, you know, how far you can go, right? What you can aspire to, but also making sure that it's all public information, which is hard. You know, she said this is hard from an HR perspective, but. She, they say they have 100% pay equity across gender and race, which is pretty incredible. Um, but it's you know not only gathering the data, but making sure they're doing that year after year after year, because if you just do it once and you know just do one big audit and you think you're done, well, a year later, those gaps are gonna start to creep back. And so you just have to be very intentional. Um, I'll use that word again. and year after year after year intentional. Like the work doesn't stop when you do one pay review or you hire one woman to the C-suite or or the or bring a woman into the boardroom. We're not one and done. We have to keep going and be consistent and do this work over time or it's, or it's, it's not gonna make a substantive, substantive difference. Yeah, and those are, I mean, great examples of of the actual, real sort of gritty work that that needs to get done. We we have uh, published our our pay ranges um, both internally and externally, and and also do a, an annual equity review to which gets us at the end of every year across uh, gender and ethnicity to to parity. Our aspiration actually is to go beyond the annual review and to actually build the models into our compensation system. So every quarter when decisions are made. We're not making decisions that then have to get addressed at the end of the year, but mm -hmm. we're actually maintaining 100% equity throughout. So, uh, but it's real work, and and so and I definitely applaud anyone who's trying to do that work. Um, well, and also, I mean, I would applaud. Like, this is a bright spot. Talking to you is yeah. a bright spot. The fact that you care, the fact that you, you know, started reading, you know, more women authors. Uh, you know, there's so much good, healthy conversation that's happening um, around these issues. And we also, we just need to make sure it's being followed up with real action, right? Because I think the pandemic, especially, there's a lot of concern that the pandemic could set women back, right? Um, you know, more, you know, more women have chosen to leave their jobs or lost their jobs because of the pandemic, because they take on the responsibility, more caregiving responsibilities, whether it's for children or elderly parents. And we don't want to, we don't want to lose progress right it's it's hard enough as it is right and so just being conscious of that and making sure that this is still a top priority um even as we're just trying to reopen our offices and um get our revenue back on track right um it needs to be a top priority of you know obviously leadership but i think it can also be a top priority for people across an organization um making sure you're having these conversations and also giving your workforce the tools to make decisions that will have an impact. 
I wanted to ask a little bit about um, what you've seen that, uh, if anything, has changed since you published the book. So it's it's certainly not old, but yeah. four years in in tech time, uh, you know, could could can be like twenty or thirty. Um, you know, it one thing that 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 uh, when I was thinking about this question that uh, just popped into my mind was you know the Bain Crypto Fund uh, ah. launched on International Women's Day, yes. <laughs> tweet, tweeting out their amazing new team of all men. Um, one thing that I that I thought about that though is, you know, okay, nothing has changed if that's happening, but at the same time, they got destroyed for it, which maybe might not have happened four or five years ago. So um, is that change or, or what, what have you seen? Yeah, I think that's an example of how things can change, right? Um, and, you know, I don't even want to use the words to their credit, but they did apologize. They took it down. Now they're working harder to find more women. I'm sure they're not going to put another picture up of their website unless it has some <laughs> more women on it. So, hey, you know, you know, I think good intentions are great, but also um, if there's a little bit of shame involved in some of the work being done here, that's okay too. We need actual numbers to change in order to make a real difference. It's not going to change if, if, if we we're just all talking about it. Right. Um, and so, you know, obviously I think an example like that is disheartening it, like looking at the numbers of, you know, 2% women, 2% of venture capital funding going to women that's really depressing, right? Like what happened? It has not moved at all um, in the last four years. The, the people who put a, a positive spin on that say, well, the amount of venture capital has just ballooned. And so women are getting the same size of a bigger pie, right? The same size piece of a bigger pie. And I'm just like, oh, but that's not good enough. Um, if you look at the numbers of women check writers, it's uh, the percentage there is slightly up. The percentage of women in engineering is slightly up. You do have more transparency from companies publishing numbers, um, you know, doing these paid transparency um, reviews. And I think all of that is a good thing. Um, I'm interviewing Serena Williams about her launching a venture capital fund. But also, you know, I don't know if anyone saw the New York Times published um, a story on her venture capital fund and accidentally printed a picture of Venus instead of Serena. And, you know, she's like, how can we change the world if even I am overlooked? You know, these biases even affect me, the most famous uh, athlete in the world, maybe the greatest athlete of all time. They still get me mixed up with my sister, right? So like th this <laughs> bias still exists, still is pervasive. There are still barriers and we just cannot, we, we cannot sit back. We need to keep up the momentum, right? Um, and I mentioned the pandemic because I think it was, you know, maybe we lost a little momentum because we're facing a global pandemic, but we have to keep up the pressure and the momentum and making sure that you know, not just these conversations are happening, but that action is following up. Yeah, and, and thinking about your comment about the, you know, the small piece of a bigger pie, it's like trickle down is still a trickle, right? So mm -hmm. it, uh, that that mm -hmm. doesn't quite work. So let me, um, <laughs> as, as we're, as we're um, winding down here time-wise, um, let me ask a, 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 a personal question, which is that, so um, I have two daughters, one mm -hmm. of them works in tech. Um, and she uh, started out actually working for, she spent the last um, three and a half years working at a women, uh, woman founded uh, company. And um, she had a very different work environment, certainly than, than she would have had she joined Trilogy in the, in the 1990s. Um, but with all of this, I know you have, you have, I believe three boys and one daughter. Mm -hmm. How would you feel about your daughter going into tech? Um, so look, I feel like tech needs talented women. We need your voices. We can't settle for the status quo. We can't let the barriers and, um, you know, systemic issues get in our way. So I would certainly, um, support my daughter going into technology and I'm glad your daughter is in the technology industry, but we need them to be coming into this industry with their, with their eyes open and understanding kind of, um, the you know barriers that they'll face and give them tools for how to how to deal with that. Um, uh, 
um, hopefully your daughter can change the industry in time for my daughter <laughs> um, to, to enter it. But like, look, I also, I, I've, I've, I've talked to so many people who said, I'm so glad you're doing this for our girls. I have daughters. I'm so glad you're doing this for them. Well, I have three sons and I want this for them. You know, I think their lives will be better in a more equal world. And like, I, you know, you know, we need to, we need to talk to our sons about this. You know, it, it, it's, it's as simple as, you know, reading, I don't know how many of you have read a children's book and like the gender roles are just totally traditional. And, you know, sometimes I'm like, I'm not reading this book anymore. Or, you know, that dads can be teachers and moms can go to work and girls can be superheroes, you, you know, just making sure that you are taking those opportunities to, to remind your kids, tell your kids, like, this isn't the way that we want the world to be. And, and you can change it too. Right. Um, hopefully that we can change the world for the next generation and make it better for them. Um, because, you know, this is an industry that has so much power to do so much good. Um, but also can, it, that can have negative consequences. As we've seen, the impact of technology isn't always good, but it is always powerful. Um, so we need all voices to be represented. Yeah. And it's a really important point about your boys that, um, often, you know, there's, there's a variety of different, uh, opposing voices that you hear in these discussions and, a lot of them center around this idea of it's a zero sum game. Um, but generally, uh, the evidence is that, you know, increased accessibility is good for everyone. Um, mm -hmm. And my favorite example, we talk about this a lot at Indeed, is accessibility ramps outside of buildings, which certainly are very helpful or necessary for someone who's in a wheelchair, but um, someone who's pushing a stroller or mm -hmm. someone who's carrying a big package or someone with a bad knee, like everyone wins when things become more accessible and, and more equitable. And so I think that's that's one of the, the biggest delusions that that needs to be smashed in all of this. Um, so I'll, I'll ask the, the same last question that I always ask in these discussions, which is when you look back over the last couple of years with everything we've been through with the pandemic um, and so much of it being, um, you know, incredibly challenging and difficult and sad. Um, what, if anything, that you've been through in the last couple of years has left you with any optimism? These conversations, I get so energized um, just hearing the work that you're doing. Just the interview that I just did before running in here um, with the you know chief human resources officer at Twitter, like people care. People are working on this. Um, it's not going to happen overnight, but I just hope that yours are the are the the voices that went out right um and uh you know i i couldn't do this without you know obviously being a realistic person but having a healthy dose of optimism i i recently interviewed a woman venture capitalist and i i asked the same question you know how do you not let these numbers get you down like how is this still happening she said well i am optimistic af i'm optimistic <laughs> af that we are moving in the right direction. Sometimes it'll be two steps forward and three steps back. Sometimes it'll be five steps forward and one step back, right? Um, and we just have to keep the pressure on at every level of the organization. Well, um, thank you, Emily, so much for joining me today. Thank you for um, your really powerful work and which has had a big impact on me. And I know lots of other people who've, who've read it. Um, and I'll just throw in a plug here. If you haven't read the book yet, please go out to your local independent bookseller and pick up a copy of Brotopia. It is phenomenal. And um, thank you again for everything and for joining me today. Thank you, Chris. It's an honor to be here. Thank you for reading the book and for helping me spread the message and for doing all the things that you're doing. Um, it's really wonderful to hear. Mm -hmm.